Coming up on Centennial Sportsnet, it's a Blue Jays bush party as Toronto clinches the AL Division Series in a dramatic game for the ages. Canadian curling star Scott Howard shares what it's like to follow in his dad's footsteps and love for the sport. And the defending champion Boston Blades were determined to leave Toronto with a victory. Dogs can be athletes too. Just ask our very own Kyle Enright as he figures out what it takes to become a dog agility trainer. Centennial Sportsnet, watch it! Hello and welcome to tonight's episode of Centennial Sportsnet. I'm Stacey Deshawn, alongside my partner in crime, Dwayne Turner. Now, Dwayne, do we really want to talk about Game 4 of the AL Championship Series tonight? To be honest, Stacey, I don't know if there's anything to talk about. I mean, the Jays fell 14-2 to here in Game 4, and they have a tall task to be able to rescue this series and make it to the World Series. But... Hey, at least we have some highlights from Game 5 of the ALDS. How did they get there, Stacey? Yes, let's take a look. AL Division Series, Game 5, the seventh inning, and an epic bat flip from Jose Bautista. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And probably where you were when the Jays beat the Rangers 6-3 in a game that will be remembered by generations now and to come. Our very own James Gardner and Nelson Perez were on site to witness how the fans and the team reacted to their special win. With one giant swing of the bat, the Toronto Blue Jays are moving on to the American League Championship Series and the relationship with their fans is something everybody is enjoying. Wow, you're not giving up credit to these guys and thrilled for the fans, thrilled for everybody across Canada. What we're seeing now is just, it's, I get the chills, it's amazing to see. Fans unable to attend the game took to many of our local establishments to enjoy in the excitement. It has been amazing, even on the long weekend where everybody's at home with their families, they're still coming out to support the Blue Jays and support everybody, it's been unreal. Our own Nelson Perez was able to catch up with the team after the dramatic Game 5 celebrations. I was frozen. I put my hands up in the air. It's just the greatest moment I've ever had on a baseball field. Yeah, I've actually hit that sound uh, over 40 times this year, so I'm pretty used to it. The guy's amazing. He's my hero. That was crazy. Crazy series, like you said, to beat down 0-2 and then have this controversial game. Uh, Batista with the big home run. Obviously, we're excited, uh, and hopefully, uh, I know we go all the way. Great job standing here. No, too. I didn't let it affect me, and it didn't, and we pulled off a great win. After 22 years, the Toronto Blue Jays are back in the postseason, and they're now moving to the American League Championship Series, beating the Texas Rangers after going down 2-0 at home. They managed to come back in a fifth game filled with drama. Here's a reaction post-game from these players. The one you see in the back, you're going to see it next in the American League Championship Series. The 2015-2016 season of the CWHL got underway this past weekend, and the defending champion Boston Blades made the trip up north to take on the Toronto Furies. This was actually a rematch of last year's Clarkson Cup. Toronto Furies looking to follow up their 2-0 victory against the Boston Blades the night before with a win on Sunday, but the Blades had other things on their mind. Aaron Kickham thinks she scores here, but the net pops off taking the goal off the board, much to the dismay of her teammates. Things would get Physical here as Blades captain Tara Watchorn's poor clearing attempt leads to a chance for the Furies. Whistle blows, but that doesn't stop these ladies from getting a few hits in there. That scrum seemed to motivate the Furies as they unleashed a barrage of shots by Blades goalie Genevieve Lacasse. But last year's regular season goaltending champion was up to the task. The Blades look to be the aggressor in the second and it pays off as Elizabeth Tremblay will get her own rebound and goes top shelf to give the Blades a 1-0 lead. Now, in order to tie the game, it was going to take something special to beat Lacasse. Or, well, I guess maybe a fluttering puck. 
Either way, the Furies' Jessica Vela ties the game with her first of the early campaign. 1-1 is the score. The third period solved nothing, but overtime had some late drama here. Fury's goalie Christina Kessler was forced to make an incredible save here on the captain Watchhorn to force a shootout as time expires. Onto the shootout, Christina Brown is the second skater up for the Blades and she absolutely fools Kessler here to put her team up one. What a goal by Forsberg. Oh, I mean Brown. With the Furies needing to score to extend the shootout, Natalie Spooner steps up, but just like she did 41 times in the rest of the game, she makes the stop. The Blades split the back-to-back -back with their 2-1 shootout victory in what truly was a goaltending treat. It was early in the season, so at times it was a messy game with five penalties for the Blades and six for the Furies, but it didn't stop the netminders. Kessler finished with 27 saves, and Lacasse made 41 en route to the victory. breast cancer awareness. Our furry friends show us you can teach a dog new tricks. And we take to the shores in support of Team Canada's Olympic prospects. That's next on Centennial Sportsnet. Take your game to the next level. Hi, my name is Wayne Moore. I'm a running back from McMaster Marauders. Orion Edwards, third year defensive back. University of Guelph, and I'm a super elite athlete. I mean, super elite athlete. Football camps like Super Elite uh, train the student athletes in specific skills you know, to be able to play and compete at the next level. I do a great job of coaching the players, uh, teaching the players, and, and more importantly, uh, getting them ready to, uh, to be successful if they decide to go on to play university football. I think what separates Super Elite from other camps is just that. Our attention to detail, the fundamentals, right? We're just here to try and help kids get better at the grassroots level, right? Just on the basic fundamentals, learning the basic concepts. We try to walk through our drills before we actually start jogging going full speed. Be the next super elite athlete. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, with community events being held in the country to raise money for the cause. One such sporting event is the University of Guelph's annual Think Pink football game. This year, the Guelph Griffins host the University of Windsor Lancers in OUA action. Alumni Stadium, looking quite pretty if I do say so myself, decorated for the charitable occasion, and Guelph's last homestand of the regular season. Football players rocking that fuchsia as well, looking good guys, with the struggling one in five Windsor Lancers looking for a W against the number seven Griffins. First half, mere seconds in the game, Windsor's running back Terrence Crawford busts loose for a 92-yard run, blazing past Guelph's defense on the very first play before going down at the one. From the one-yard line here, Crawford punches in for six, and the Lancers take a lead. Fun fact though, Crawford is the younger brother of Dallas Cowboys defensive tackle Tyrone Crawford. Later in the first, the Griffins reply with a two-yard strike as quarterback James Roberts connects with Jason, Jacob Scarphone for the major, Guelph up 17-7. Early in the second, it's Lancers 34, Nick Vincent with the block punt recovery to take possession deep in Griffin's territory. 14 Casey Wright hands it over to Crawford who rumbles in for the nine yard TD and Guelph's lead is cut 34-21. Windsor looking to score again as kicker and friend of the show, Anthony Malandriglo nails a 32 yard field goal, his second straight field goal as the Lancers try to close the gap 34-27. One minute left on the clock, Griffin's in the red zone, and running back John Augustine restores the double-digit lead through traffic, Guelph up 41-27. Griffin's defense seals the deal, though, with a big interception from Casey Wright, who picks off Nicholas Soto as the clock winds down. Guelph moves to 6-1, final score 41-27. Let's take a look at the scoreboard. Wright and Crawford shine, but take the L for the Lancers. They host Waterloo to end the regular season. And then also for Guelph, they have their Roberts and Augustine banking two touchdowns each. They'll visit Carlton for their last game. We've all heard the saying that a dog is a man's best friend, but sometimes dogs deserve to be the highlight for once. And our very own Kyle Enright went to the McCann Agility Center to find out exactly what it takes to make these dogs faster and more disciplined than any other furry friend in the nation. <laughs> A 
About 20 minutes north of Hamilton up Highway 6, you'll find buried in the back roads the McCann Professional Dog Trainers and their Agility Center. McCann has been Canada's leading dog trainers since 1982 and specialize in agility as well as overall discipline. Kale McCann, one of 32 certified McCann dog trainers, took some time after one of her level one agility classes to talk to me and share what they're all about. All right, Kyle Enright here with Kale McCann and Kale. That was a very interesting class. I've never actually seen one before, but looking at this class here, it looks like uh, it's a tremendous level of uh, commitment to get the dogs to listen and to pay attention, especially with the beginners. Is it tough to go through four levels of dogs? I know there's uh, levels one, two, three, and four, and even a higher class. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to, to juggle those different uh, uh, classes? It is. I think when people come into agility, they don't necessarily know what their final goal is going to be, which is totally cool with us. So when they start at this level that you uh, that you just saw at level one, they sort of don't really know much about what mm. agility is, or they're just sort of starting out. Then they can go through the next level where we start to incorporate more obstacles and then the third level is sort of our recreational level we call it skills and drills so where people can come so if people don't really have an interest in competing with their dogs and they just kind of want to do this for fun like exercise each week then they can come to that but usually what happens is people bite the agility bug and then all of a sudden they're like oh I kind of like this mm -hmm. and then um, we have a competition uh, class where people can go into that they will prepare them for competing and then the highest level of class is called international handling so for people who have aspirations of maybe being on Team Canada. Um, myself and my co-instructor Jamie are both members of Team Canada so um, I think a lot of our students are exposed to that type of, of thing because we do it so some of them have huge aspirations for themselves and their dogs so we try to help them no matter what goal there is whether it's just for fun or whether they have like really big goals. Um, hopefully there's something for everybody. Mm -hmm. And finally I noticed your dog is incredibly disciplined. What's the timeline for a dog that's just beginning these classes? to get to that level where they're sitting, staying, not going for the toy, going through the tunnels when they're told to. How long of a timeline does that take? Um, I think it varies per person and per dog, depending on their skill level or the um, type of dog, not breed, but the type of dog that you have. Some dogs are really keen to just sort of please their owners, where some are a little bit more um, independent. I would say anywhere from two to three years or two to five years for the average person. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. stuff here happening at the McCann Agility Dog Center. I'm here with one of our awesome contestants. This is Maggie. And Maggie, how was the class today? Was it good? Can I have a handshake? How about a handshake? And how about a high five? How about a high five? Back to you guys. Seven members of the national sailing team have high hopes of earning their tickets to Rio. However, with three qualifying spots available and a hefty price tag, it won't be an easy journey. Pamela Kiss spent the day of sailing with Everett McLaughlin and spoke on Team Canada's preparations for next year's Summer Olympics. I'm Pamela Kiss from the Royal Canadian Yacht Club where I spoke with Everett McLaughlin, one of seven members of the National Olympic Sailing Team that have joined forces to raise funds for their very expensive road to qualify for only three spots in Rio 2016. Sailing is one of the most expensive Olympic sports. Despite being opponents on the water, the Royal Canadian Jack Club group of seven athletes are collaborating to represent the nation in Rio on the three coveted categories of radial, laser and the 49er. All the national team athletes uh, here at RCYC got together and basically created this G7 group so that together we could kind of raise awareness and hopefully raise some more support and funding together. So yeah, this, the Olympics for the laser at least is, uh, well for all classes, is only one person per country and there'll be about 40 countries at the Olympics. So we are working together to raise awareness uh, and raise money, but in the end we'll be competing against each other. The G7 must attend between four to six crucial regattas around the world. The average annual budget to campaign successfully on the international stage is approximately $75,000, of which only 30% is funded by Sail Canada and the government. We basically have to raise ourselves. Uh, some of that is done just through individual fundraising, through friends, family, and anyone we can reach out to. Reach out to. Through May until October, the Royal Canadian Yacht Club supports the G7 
by hosting regattas and midweek races. For a small fee, they offer the public the chance to sail with members of the G7 and become involved in the beautiful sport of sailing. Any kind of sailing that I do, any, any kind of competitions, is all kind of working on my uh, skills and techniques that I can bring back to the laser and help uh, with my final goal of yeah, Rio, the Olympics. Yeah, it's a pretty tricky venue, so I'm happy that at least uh, some Canadians and coaches have gone before to get some sort of information and hopefully bring that back to whoever goes, hopefully me. I think what the G7 is doing in terms of what they're getting in, like from support on the volunteer side is just incredible. And it's, it's so important to help these guys get to Rio. Canada is a water nation. We've got water everywhere. We've got massive coastlines. Like, why are we not winning things? It's about damn time we start winning and our athletes need support to start doing that. Next up, we have our basketball insiders here to tell you how the ball will bounce for the Toronto Raptors this year. The Don Mills Flyers look to turn things around at the home this season in GTHL action. And it's a family affair at the High Park Club with an Olympic bid on the line. Stay tuned. Are you bored at home? Tired of staying in on a Friday night with no plans? Well, the third and long hotline is here for you. We have operators standing by 24-7 to answer all your hottest and deepest fantasy football questions. Don't have a cell phone? Stuck at work? Is traffic too heavy on the local newspaper website? Call our toll-free number. What do you have to lose? Call now. 1-888-555-6969. Our experts can help you determine who to start, sit, stash, or quit. What's your fantasy? Six, nine, six, nine. Dwayner, oh, oh, we're back oh, on the sorry, air. Sorry, my mistake, guys. Hey, you know what? My fantasy team could use all the help I can get right now. So sorry about that, Stacy. Anyway, forget about my imaginary team. Let's talk about the real 30 teams that are going to be entering the NBA season this year. What do you think, Stacy? Sounds good to me. And so does the fact that the NBA season starts in seven days. How exciting! It's been a busy offseason with some major player acquisitions across the league, especially for Canada's sole franchise. Our basketball insiders Kyle Enright and Flip Livingstone discuss what Jurassic Park fans can expect from their Toronto Raptors. <laughs> Kyle right here alongside NBA analyst Flip Livingstone and Flip with the Toronto sports scene catching a lot of blue fever with the Blue Jays doing as well as they are. People might forget there's actually a basketball season starting off in a week and a half's time with the Raptors going 0 for 4 last year in the postseason against the Washington Wizards swept in Washington. How do you think they'll rebound this year coming out of the gates? Well Kyle I think the start to any season is key for any team but more so this year with the Toronto Raptors who are a club Lacking confidence coming out of a tough playoff performance last year, as you said, getting swept away by the Washington Wizards. I think this year is even more crucial that this team gets off to a hot start, as I could see an early losing streak really burying them out of the gate, Kyle. And of course, Masai Ujiri sitting in that front office after the sweep. He addressed some serious issues on the team, one of those being defense. He goes out, he gets a veteran presence like Damari Carroll, like Luis Scola, also adding some young talent in Anthony Bennett and Corey Joseph. Which of these new names do you see making the biggest improvement on the Raptors team? Well, Kyle, I think the easy answer would be looking to a veteran like Luis Scola, who is coming off a very strong summer performance with Team Argentina. But I look to a younger player, Jonas Valanciunas, as really the backbone and key to success for this Toronto Raptors team moving forward. They have a lot of time and money invested in this young player, and I really do think that it's him will be the key to the Raptors' success moving forward. And of course, Jonas Valanciunas rounds out the big three for the Raptors with Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan. Of course, DeMar DeRozan entering a contract year. Do you think he has the ability to move up and say the upper echelon of the league with the James Harden, with the Klay Thompson, and really contend for that top shooting guard spot? I think that would be a tall task for DeMar to put his name amongst some of the greatest players in the NBA today. The names you've just mentioned, Kyle, those are MVP caliber players. And I think even though DeMar is in a contract year and I expect a big season from him, I think it's a very tall task 
for a player like DeMar DeRozan to elevate his game to amongst those MVP players like Harden and Thompson. But I do still expect a great season from number 10. We can't wait for the NBA season to get started. The Raptors tip off against the Indiana Pacers October 28th at the Air Canada Center. It should be a great season. We're looking forward to it. Thanks a lot for doing this clip. Anytime, Kyle. The Don Mills Flyers have played eight games so far, and it, to be honest, it has been a rough go so far. They only have two wins on the year, and none of them have come at home. It wasn't going to get any easier with three key players missing, including Jack McBain, who has two goals for the team, and with Toronto Junior Canadians in town. We opened this up with both goalies getting warmed up. And I got to tell you, one netbinder would have a great day, the other, eh, so-so. And the action begins early as Watsi tries to open the scoring for the Canadians. He corrals the puck off the turnover and shoots. But Mayhew and his defensemen clear the early threat. Flyers chance now as DeVoe receives the puck off the boards. Looks to score short side, but misses. A loose puck finds Timmerman, who races down the right side towards the keeper. He goes for the backhand. As it trickles through the crease, DeVoe is there to sweep it away. More Canadians pressure follows as DePaulo flies down the ice, blowing by defenders, but his shot goes wide. Great period for the Canadians, but coach Silvio Aron was looking for goals. Perhaps the pep talk could pump up his players. Timmerman fights for the puck on the right side of the corner, centers it for Falls, who slaps the shot past the keeper, opening the scoring for the Canadians. Grand celebration is in order for that one. The Canadians were hitting all cylinders as another offensive possession leads to another goal. Wozni's rocket gives the Canadians a 2-0 lead. On to the third frame, where the score is 3-0. And the Canadians were looking for padding to that lead when a stretch pass finds Falls, who bursts forward. Shot beats Mayhew, but Stahig is there to put it past after it hits the post. 4-0 now. With the game well in hand and the Canadians looking for their fifth, DePaulo snags the puck and fights to get it home. But it's what's happening behind the net that was the story. That kick to the head led to a huge brawl between both teams. But he, in the end, it was the junior Canadians who were the winners of the night. You could even say that they whipped them on their way to 5-0 victory on the road. Canadian curler Glenn Howard has competed alongside fellow legends of the sport, such as Wayne Madaw, Richard Hart, and Craig Seville. However, a brand new teammate is on this year's roster, his son, Scott Howard. Alexander Cayley caught up with the Howards to discuss their shared love for curling. Ducelle's Toronto Tankard is a tournament featuring teams from Canada, the USA, and international powers like Sweden and China. It's a proving ground for veterans and new stars alike, the perfect setting for a father-son duo looking to find their legs on what could be a historic run to the Olympics. Yeah, it wasn't so much the Olympics as it was, uh, it's a bit on my bucket list. It's actually, I wanted to be able to play with my son at some point in my career, but I also want to make sure it was a time in my career that I still have game, that I'm still playing well. And I've got two or three more good years left in me. I'd love to finish that with my son. That being said, it is leading up to the 2018 Olympics, so that's all going to be a part and parcel of the whole package and trying to, to earn our spot and, and get to the Olympics. So uh, the main reason is just I want to play competitively with my son for a few years and see what happens, and then the Olympics could be a bonus. Coming over from the recently splintered Team Keen, Scott Howard is finally getting the opportunity to play with his father, something not unfamiliar to the rest of the Howard family. Yes, I have got a lot of advice from my sister and my, uh, my mom. They're one of our biggest supporters, same with my, uh, my nanny. And uh, yeah, it's just pretty cool to curl with my dad. It's, uh, it's a dream come true for me, and I, hopefully it's a dream come true for him. So uh, we're going to try it hard for the next two years and hopefully go to represent Canada in the Olympics. To represent Canada would be a dream come true for anybody, and there's not a lot of curlers out in there that could say that. And for my dad to, to go to the next Olympics would be, would, would be something. He, uh, he'd be 55, I believe, in Olympics, which would be uh, the oldest athlete ever to uh, compete in the Games. And to ever win the Olympics medal would be something pretty cool at that age. To, rep to be with my dad at the Olympic trials, Olympics, hopefully, would be uh, something I'd never forget. And hopefully we can experience that. With countless national, provincial, and world curling championships to his name, it's more than just an Olympic bid that keeps Glenn motivated. You know what? It's really the, the, fun, the fun that I have in the game. Uh, I, I play with my buddies, and obviously this year I play with my son. Uh, I just love to curl, and it's, I love to curl, I love to compete. 
Uh, I still want to get out of bed and throw rocks. I still want to get in an airplane and travel all over the world and all over Canada to compete. And that's really what motivates me. It's, it's, a, it's the fun of the game. Uh, I, I know one of these days I'll get out of bed and I'll realize I've had enough curling, I've thrown enough rocks, and it's time to pack it in. But I haven't reached that point yet. I really do love it. Uh, I, I like to win, I like to compete, and, uh, and again, I'm having fun. Until it's not fun, then it's time, uh, then it's time to pack it in. The Olympic trials aren't for another two years, and Pyeongchang a year after that. But for the Howards, the journey is far more important than the destination. Alexander K. Lee, Centennial Sportsnet. Great piece, Alex. And just like father like son, I'm sure Del Curry has to be one proud father knowing that his son, Steph Curry, was able to bring home the NBA championship to Golden, S Golden, S uh, Golden State. Wouldn't you say, Stacey? Yes, definitely. But there are 29 other teams that we are looking forward to seeing. Which ones are you most excited for? I'm really interested to see how Chica the Chicago Bulls do. You know, they got a new coach, Fred Hoiberg, and, you know, they're kind of transitioning from Derrick Rose as the leader to now Jimmy Butler. I'm interested to see what they do now with that team. For me, I'm, ex in, I'm excited to see the OKC with Kevin Durant back in the lineup. I'm also excited to see the Spurs, but unfortunately we'll have to wait for another week and you'll also have to wait for another week of our next episode. On behalf of Dwayne and myself, Stacey Deshaun, thank you for watching and see you next time.